Good morning. I am uh, joined by Captain Kevin Riley of the New York State Police. I'm sure you all know Captain Umbrino for major crimes behind me here and First Assistant District Attorney Perry Duckles. I'm going to start this morning a little differently. Usually at the end I take questions from the media. I'd like to know, and I'm going to ask, we'll see who's brave enough to volunteer. Who, who generally knows the population of the city of Rochester? Anybody? 210,000. 210,000. Out of the 210,000, there's about 600, 700 if I were fully staffed. Right now there's about 600 people that run towards gunfire. The rest run away from it. As a result of the bravery of these 600 men and women in the RPD and our multi-faceted multi violence reduction programs that we've put into place, there has been a significant decrease in shootings. And I brought here a visual aid, you're probably not going to be able to see it very well. It is on the open data portal, I'm sure Captain Bellow can get it for you. But this is the rolling 365 of our shooting victims. This goes from 2010 to current. So if you look here, here's 2010 levels, here's where we're almost back to in shooting victims. It's a precipitous decrease. On the stolen vehicle front, Besides the everyday efforts of the rank and file stopping and arresting people in stolen vehicles, we've been doing multi-agency details this summer with the RPD, MCSO, and the New York State Police. The results of these details, about one a week, has been 36 stolen vehicles recovered, 212 traffic stops, 265 traffic tickets, 17 misdemeanors, nine felony arrests, 45 warrant arrests, and one gun recovered, and that's just the detail, and Captain Bellow can again get you those numbers because they're not in the, uh, in the press release. As a result, the number of vehicles stolen in the city of Rochester and Monroe County has dropped this year. But despite our best efforts to hold those that bring this evil to our community and the destruction in our community accountable, some people continue to wreak havoc again and again until sadly someone dies and we find ourselves here. And I'm talking about another death in our community. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Yesterday, a 17-year-old career criminal, think about that, he's 17 years old. We know this individual quite well. We're not releasing names yet. We know this individual quite well and we'll get into that. This 17-year-old career criminal has taken the life of a 92-year-old member of our community yesterday in a pursuit. This 17-year-old has faced numerous criminal charges throughout his short life. We've arrested him repeatedly. Other agencies have arrested him repeatedly. And he's on parole. Parole at 17 years of age. So yesterday around 3.30 p.m., we got a shot spotter activation for the area of Mariah Street, Bernard Street. I've listened to the shot spotter activation. And you can, many times in these, actually, when you hear the gunfire, detect different caliber weapons. This was a gunfight. You can hear different caliber weapons in this shot spotter activation. So officers from the Clinton section working third platoon were heading out a roll call. They went to the scene. First call of the day for them. Now think about that, too. These men and women were home, did whatever they do in the mornings. They were with their families. They came to work. They put on this uniform that I wear proudly. They did a roll call. They got in their cars. And they ran toward gunfire, as they do every day. Well, en route to this call, they were alerted to numerous 911 calls reporting shots fired in a motor vehicle collision on the scene. Upon arriving, they located a motor vehicle collision at the intersection of Clifford and Mariah Street that involved a Kia that had been previously reported stolen in a Rondequoit and also had bullet holes in it. Witnesses at the scene described males fleeing the shooting scene in a Kia. So again, thank you to the community for helping us in our efforts. As I've said before, the level of community cooperation has uh, increased dramatically. We could not do this without the help of the community. 
A nearby officer located one of the suspects near the intersection of Clifford Avenue and Barron Street. The male, aged 19, immediately ran from the officer and a foot chase ensued toward Friedrich Park. While on Friedrich Park, the suspect was picked up in a different stolen Kia. That Kia then backed at a high rate of speed directly to an officer on Friedrich Park. And I watched that body worn camera video. You can see the officer bracing in the car because he's pretty sure he's going to get hit pretty hard by this stolen Kia. This behavior also, unfortunately, has become a common occurrence. Suspects swerving at officers on foot. Suspects swerving at officers in cars. Reminded just this week, we had an officer safety email that went out during one pursuit that another Kia involved itself, and the officers could actually see the male was wearing a helmet and was trying to interfere with the police cars and run them off the road out of this pursuit. The officers relocated this vehicle on Barron Street and attempted to stop it. The vehicle failed to stop and a pursuit began. This pursuit lasted approximately eight minutes and ended in a motor vehicle collision at the intersection of East Avenue and Elmwood Avenue. The suspect vehicle was traveling southbound on East Avenue and struck a vehicle that was turning westbound onto Elmwood Avenue. Officers and firefighters from the Brighton Fire Department was right on the corner there. We thank them for their help. The Brighton Fire Department immediately came out to assist. Um, again, I've watched the body-worn camera on this. You see the officers approach the suspect car. You see the officers take the suspects into custody as they were trained, and immediately, as soon as the handcuffs go on, you hear them talking to each other about assessing the medical condition of these suspects, placing them in the recovery position, making sure they're breathing, calling for ambulances, and then, you hear the officer, one of the officers, directing another responding officer to go check on the condition of the victim in the vehicle that was struck. Sadly, the operator of the other vehicle was 92-year-old Thomas Chase of Brighton, and he was killed in a collision. I didn't know anything about Thomas then. I've come to learn through Captain Umbrino, who's met with the family or talked to the family, that 92-year-old Thomas, Thomas Chase was a graduate of the Eastman School of Music. He was an active volunteer across our community. He leaves behind a devastated family that is left to pick up the pieces because, once again, teenagers are driving around recklessly in a stolen vehicle. I didn't know Mr. Chase. I went to the scene. Commander DeSane had already done an excellent job of scene management, had things well in hand, so I did what I always do. I went and I checked on my officers involved. And two officers were over by Mr. Chase's car. I checked on my officers, gave him a hug, and I went over to Mr. Chase's car. I've been doing this 32 years. I've seen a lot of things. Mr. Chase was there still in his car, covered with a blanket. He said the Lord's Prayer for Mr. Chase, because no one was there with him. No one but us. There were three teenagers in the suspect Kia at the time of the collision. The initial 19-year-old male that ran from the officers and a 17-year-old driver and an 18-year-old passenger. They were all transported to Strong Hospital with serious but non-life-threatening injuries. As the investigation continued, officers located evidence of a 9mm handgun being fired on Bernard Street. Additionally, a loaded 9mm ghost gun, or a non-registered, non-serial number handgun, was located on Alphonse Street. That gun was discarded by the 19-year-old male while he was running from the officers. The New York State Police assisted us with both the pursuit and are providing their collision reconstruction unit at the crash site. All three of the teens remain hospitalized we are currently working with the district attorney's office regarding the appropriate charges. Thankfully, no first responders were physically injured. Physically injured. But we know these officers are going to carry the memories of this critical incident with them for the rest of their lives. It should be noted, as I mentioned earlier, this 17-year-old male driver is currently on parole for burglary. So everyone remember last year the Kia smash and grabs? 
the media sensation, the cars breaking in, the smash and grabs. It's our guy. He was arrested for 12 burglaries across the city of Rochester in 2023, in which he utilized a stolen vehicle to crash into storefronts and steal from them. Despite significant injuries from the crash, he was still able to lie to the officers about his identity. He claimed he was his 13-year-old younger brother in an effort to conceal his criminal history from us at the scene. Um, I might add, I did, I don't have it in my notes, but I found it in the elevator on the way down. He was arrested three weeks ago in a stolen car from Frank. A stolen car in a chase in Erie County. <clears throat> um, in July, the 18-year-old passenger was arrested in a nearby town for charges related to a stolen vehicle. The investigation into this incident is ongoing by both the major crimes unit. So the major crimes unit will handle the criminal charges into these three suspects in the Kia. The New York State Attorney General's office will be investigating the circumstances of the pursuit um, and as they do in any, in any critical incident. So the Attorney General's office will be handling that investigation. As always, there will be a professional standard section internal review of our policies, procedures, our chase. Um, initially, after a cursory review from everything yesterday, I see no violations of our pursuit policy. Anyone with information from the scene, and it was a very chaotic scene yesterday, so we're still working to put things together. We could always use more witnesses, more help. It's encouraged to call the Major Crimes Unit at 428-7157 or email majorcrimes at cityofrochester.gov. As I said in closing, I mean, my folks are working. We're working. Something isn't working. By the time we're arresting these folks, it's usually too late. They're already involved. But at the time of arrest, should be a chance for them to change their lives or if they're unwilling to change their lives, there's consequences. Men and women of the Rochester Police Department are fighting for the citizens of this community every day. I'll uh, open up to questions. Chief, what would you suggest is the change we need? I'm not here to solve society's problems. I can tell you. Well, there needs to be apparently uh, some cultural changes where it's okay for some folks to think that this behavior is all right because they saw it on the internet. And again, I'm not painting with a broad brush, not all folks. This is a small percentage, but this small percentage radically affects our community. So at some point in these young folks' lives, I would think there would be someone out there that would be able to identify that they're going down the wrong road in some intervention and some help and some programs. There's all kinds of resources out there. What, what are we missing? I don't know, that's not my realm. But I can tell you this, when it does come into our realm and we do our part, I shouldn't be standing here now because we did our part last year. Everyone seems to play the blame game. The judges will tell you they have no choice. The legislatures will tell you the judges have a choice. I don't know. You have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. Sometimes it's a mixture of both, but I can tell you clearly it's a failure that's not ours. Chief, you said that based on your preliminary observation, there was no violation of the Chase policy. Which Correct. Detailed policy. Yes. I wonder if the circumstances yesterday are going to at least prompt some kind of review on what you did. Well, yeah, we can always do things better, no doubt. You know, we review everything that we do, and we always strive to do better. So, of course, we will. Um, but you know, 
for what I see from yesterday, it was it was within the guidelines that these officers were given. So. Do you think Mr. Chase is homicide victim? Uh, I'll let uh, Captain Barino speak to the uh, possible charges that are on the table. So we're working very closely with the district attorney's office. There's obviously several different charges that could be levied against them. Uh, in order for a murder second, you need to show depraved indifference to human life. Uh, a manslaughter, you know, it's a different uh, level. So that's something that we're currently working with the district attorney's office. We're looking at it very closely, and we strongly believe that the suspect needs to get charged with the appropriate charge, whatever that may be. Um, so I don't want to speak prematurely, but yeah, I, I, he was, Mr. Chase was killed. He was killed. All right, thank you everyone.